gang. <laughs> so I've got to say, I feel a little bit of a fraud stood here right now. Um, I've listened to TED Talks for many years, and the topics and the people that, that tend to talk are just amazing. Um, and I'm sorry to say that uh, I'm not going to tell you about my new underwater town that I've been building in the North Sea. Um, obviously, it's far too cold and dark. Um, and I haven't saved a baby from a burning building. I just run a company, a new company, whose greatest achievement so far is to raise millions of pounds from venture capitalists, to spend on lovely new offices for the dogs, obviously, on great technology, and over a hundred amazing people, all to try and work, all to try and change the way that we rent forever. Now, if you asked a lot of my friends what they learned from me over the past few years, they would say, "Richard, he really knows where to get a good drink from." Look, I think, well, I hope I've got something to add here. But th there's a number of people from my childhood that would see me standing here saying, well, he's a last minute replacement, or it's just a really rubbish event. You see, from a very early age, at school when I was younger, I struggled. And people used to talk about me like, you know, there goes Richard, bless him. He's uh, in his own little world, loves a trier. But like this balloon here, <laughs> I was best left to sit at the bottom of the class and give up on. I will save that balloon. <laughs> so, look, I'm dyslexic, which doesn't help. But being labeled at such an early age as a struggler created its own momentum. You hear it so often, you begin to believe it, and then you begin to act it. Um, so, look. I think the, the thing that I'm trying to say is, it's, it's been tough. Um, it was tough growing up, and it was tough um, being in the bottom set. I mean, I remember being put into a class with a bunch of kids with differing needs, and I remember looking around just thinking, wow, yeah, these kids do need help. And I, probably the best way I could do that is to help this teacher that's supposed to be helping them. Because this teacher's got no clue. Um, and look, I never felt like I was bottom set material. I, I never felt like I was a struggler. But it became to rub off. And when a system is so intense on taking your confidence away, it's really hard. So it didn't, even, it didn't just affect me, though. It starts to affect my family. When I think back to my more kind of early entrepreneurial days, I remember people in my family being like, how's the, how's the latest scam going? Now, <laughs> it's because, it, look, they were really supportive. It wasn't that they meant any harm at all, quite the opposite. But when it came to it and trying to give advice, the easiest thing was just to make a joke about it. So, but look, things start to change. I'm not here looking for pity, really. There's not a bucket here. But if there was, you can put some money in. <laughs> I might leave my shoe. Um, look, I'm not here looking for pity. Things did change, thanks to the incredible generosity of my parents. Um, what money they did have, they put into trying to give me a better education. And um, this is where I got more one-to-one -one, um, one -one help. And, uh, and, it, was, and it, was, it was needed. Um, I began to 
to thrive. You know, there was some series of highs. One high was I got some GCSEs. Actually, they're really good for me. I, t I, was, I was over the moon. And there was some series of lows as well. I think one of the lowest was when I went for my selection to become an army officer. I always thought that I was going to go into the army. So I passed all the physical tests. Then it just came to the academic ones. I remember sat in a semicircle. You're all wearing colored bibs with numbers on. I was number five. And this guy uh, <laughs> opposite was just firing questions at me. And I just remember sat there thinking, I'm not good enough to be here. And I felt that same feeling that I felt when I was young, sat in the bottom of the class like the balloon. And I just thought, I can't do this. Look, he was asking me the simplest things. He was going like five plus five. It turned into a bit of a joke. He thought it was a joke. Because I just, he asked me this, I made 11. Honestly, I just couldn't. My, the ability to answer straightforward questions had gone out the window. And I was panicking. I was just panicking. Um, so it felt like I was at school again, but never at school. And I quote, I was sent away. <laughs> Um, with the words, he's medically fine, but academically lacking. Go away for two years and get more intelligent. That's quite the challenge. <laughs> Imagine that going through your letterbox and opening that and showing your parents, the same parents that had spent that money on your education. It was, uh, it was a bit of a disaster, really. Look, I've talked about my family. They were massively supportive. They tried everything to kind of find the right direction uh, and the uh, direction for me in life. And look, when I was 12, I wasn't a normal 12-year-old. When most 12-year-olds were doing their homework and playing video games and having sleepovers, I was out running a mobile disco company. I was doing events in the local pub. In the sixth form, me and a friend got really fed up with these yearbooks that were just annoying and bits of, like, we just thought that there's got to be something better. So we created a digital yearbook. This was on a CD-ROM. Um, so we created that, and it was, it was amazing. People loved it. Like, everyone in the school bought it. Um, and although we didn't commercialize it, this was like a taste of what life could be like. Um, so, look, then I, let, uh, I went to leave school, and a few years earlier, I would have thought, wow, leaving school, never have to do that again. But after this time, it kind of was secure, safe. I didn't want to leave the structure of, of what I had, but I had to. The army wouldn't take me, and my teacher was saying, go to university, go to university. So, okay. So I did okay at GCSEs and A-levels. So I got... I got an offer, well, I got two offers, actually. One was from Edinburgh University, mm -hmm. and one was from Oxford. Brooks. <laughs> um, I chose Oxford because, uh, Oxford Brooks, um, because that was where all my friends were going to party. Um, not that Edinburgh probably doesn't have great, well, they have great parties, but all my friends were going there. So I set, um, set to go to university. I remember my first lecture, um, I was dreading it. I was on the bus, and I was just had all these like sickening fears that, you know, what if I'm not good enough? What if I can't do the work? And going into this lecture theatre, thinking, wow, there's so many people here. I'm used to kind of classes of 12, 13 people. I don't want to make an idiot of myself in front of all these people. Um, then the lecturer said, cool. Today, what we're going to be doing is playing with Lego. I was really good at that back at primary school. The relief, it was amazing. I was like, wow, they're not expecting me to do anything. That's too hard. But then that quickly followed by this disgust. It was like, why am I paying for you to play with Lego with me? Like, there's a bit more to it than that. But it was just, I was surprised that, you know, people are charging for, for that education. So anyway, I left, left university. Um, and threw myself into the party scene, which I told you about. It was pretty good. Um, and I thought, I can do these parties better than anyone else. 
So I got to it, I got myself a venue, which turned out to be from the Russian Mafia. <sighs> really did, I'll tell you some stories about that later. Um, and got my flyers printed. I think we called the night White Light, don't know why. And um, I managed to get a, a, a drinks rep to donate a thousand drinks. So I was like, wow, this is set, what can go wrong? Um, <laughs> and I waited really expectantly outside the door. And people did arrive, four of them, five including the rep. And it was pretty, uh, it was pretty, yeah, it, it, was, it was a horrible time. All these kind of fears and emotions came rushing back. Was I doomed to fail at everything that I put my hand to? But something inside me kept me pushing on. I think. The small, about, uh, the, the small amount of positive feedback that I had along the way, I held on to. And you know what? I just stuck at it. I kept on going. And it turned out that I did have an aptitude for doing this partying, this event stuff. Quite quickly, we turned into an event and uh, turned it into quite a big event. We were attracting, I think it was around 1,500 people each week, each paying a fiver. It was quite good. I had no intention of going back to university at that point. There's no incentive. I was making good money. Um, but <laughs> when my parents came to university, and re uh, well, came to visit me at university, they realized that I wasn't at university anymore. I couldn't tell them how close we were to the university. And when my dad saw my new car that I bought, he was <laughs> thinking, oh, he's doing something dodgy. So I thought, look, this is probably not sustainable, and it's great while it lasted, but you know, just too much. So I ended up going home. And this is where I came across a quote um, from Albert Einstein, which I'm sure a lot of you know. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, that fish will spend its whole life feeling it's stupid. So with that in my mind, I carried on. And look, what I'm doing here is I'm hopefully wanting to leave you with some lessons that I learned from the bottom of the class. And the one main one is be really selective of who you listen to. You know, there are voices around you that are positive, and just remember to hold on to them. And you have to do everything to fight against all your insecurities to really make sure that you listen to them, and you build upon them. Now, after being at home for a little bit, I kind of threw myself into the rat race and started working in and around property. And um, at this point, I started to see that businesses could operate better and had better ideas for, for the way that business should be run. And th this didn't really endear me to my, um, my bosses, especially at Foxton's. They really hated me. Um, so I left, and then I joined another company. And this company was basically a flat-sharing company. And I started getting twitchy quite quickly, because I didn't see that as the big picture. I saw the actual cool idea was, look, there's lots of people out there, they can't afford to buy, they don't have the deposit, they can't get on the, the ladder. So wouldn't it be cool if those people that can't afford to buy a whole house, if they could club together and put their money and own a section of a house and get onto the property ladder and get the benefits that way? My boss just didn't see that. He just said, no, we're going to carry on doing this because it was a lifestyle business to him. He didn't have any vision. And that's what occurred to me is one of the really strong things I had was, was vision. I had three main attribute, attributes that meant that I could officially be a struggler, but succeed. So, look, after then, I had an idea for a business, and it was a really simple idea based around my own experiences on the premise that when you buy something on Amazon and eBay, isn't it easy? When you rent a property, isn't it the hardest thing you do it, like ever? It's really hard. It's so different from one click. So the thought that we could build a company that would just make renting as easy as buying something on Amazon and eBay was amazing. It would help so many people, and then we could do so many things after that. So going back to um, 
going back to the company uh, that I was at at the time when I was coming up with this idea, I remember going to my boss and I said, look, I've got this idea for this business called Good Lord. And his feedback put me back in that class really, really quickly. And he just said, stop, don't do it. Like, you have no idea what you're doing. And <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was another moment where I could have just given up and I could have just said, oh, you know what? But look, I built up my second kind of big quality and that was a really thick skin. So I had the vision, I had the perseverance. And I mean, to be honest, that guy had a bit of a point because we, we pitched seven people for investment and we got seven rejections, one after the other. So I kind of know what Robert the Breeze felt like. Um, but look, after a while, we, 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 got, we got someone who believed in our idea and our vision. His name was John. John, really nice guy. He invested 32 and a half thousand pounds in us. It was more money than I ever saw in a bank account. So I quickly ran down to the cash machine, took a picture. But anyway, uh, good news. John sold his share in the business quite recently. And he sold it for, well, two years on, a million pounds. So John's done quite well. But more and more investment came um, from, f from people in Mayfair to Israel to Silicon Valley. More and more people shared in our vision for what we wanted to create. And it was touching, it was, it was great. And we started to build this company. So I suppose, but I, I suppose the kind of, but I suppose uh, a big point I wanna leave you with is even though all this has happened, you still don't lose that label that you've got. You still don't lose those insecurities. I've still got them. Um, so you don't lose the label, you don't lose the fear. Because I, I'll tell you a, a story um, about another in, uh, other investor. Uh, there was um, a big investor, it's quite a big brand name, and we started talking to them for, um, for some investment. Uh, we met them in their Mayfair offices, and uh, it looked promising. They flew us out um, to Ireland. We had some more meetings, and then they passed. And that was fine. But then, a few months later, they picked up the phone and said, look, we're interested again. Yeah, come on. Um, so we did that whole dance again, but then a rejection came. And you know what? I could just go, I don't care. I could just send them a letter listing the millions that all their, invest, uh, all their competitors have invested in us. But still at night, I still, before I go to bed, I think, oh, how can I get these guys to invest in us? How can I get these guys to notice us? How can I do our unfi unfinished business? And how can I get their approval? Because, you know, being bottom of the class does leave its mark. So I'll, I'll close by saying, look, if you're the bottom of the class, like this little balloon, like me, then just remember, you have got loads of attributes and great strengths that actually probably don't get realized in the, um, conf um, in the structure of education. And what you know will benefit you massively outside in the real world. For the people that are the high achievers at the top of the glass, well done, you know who you are. Um, bit of advice for you guys. Don't be constrained by your current success. Don't be fearful of change. And don't always think you have to take the academic route. When you're successful, it's incredibly, you, you get a, a new type of fear where you don't want to lose it, you don't want to take risks but take those risks as well. And look, for anybody in education, just remember, or if you've got children, just remember, look, when you're talking to children and you're interacting with them, be really careful on what you say, what labels you may pin on to people. You may not mean it, but those labels have a profound effect and they stay with people for the rest of their life. Thank you.